government of Singapore to look at the water distribution networks in the city of Singapore. And they have implanted an array of about 30 wireless uh, low power sensors in the water distribution network of Singapore. They are able to track the water pressure and water quality in real time across this array and then to apply some fairly sophisticated signal processing techniques to interpret the signals they're getting. They can tell when individual users go on and off the water network. They can tell when a pipe breaks. They can also monitor in real time the pump pressures through the network so they can optimize the pumping power. And they think that they can cut the electrical consumption of the pumps by about 10% through that means. And in addition to this, they're monitoring the water quality. If there's a pipe break, there's a potential for intrusions and contamination of the water. Another project that's being done in that uh, same vicinity is being done by Professor Janelle Thompson, also in civil environmental engineering. Janelle is looking at the use of microbiological techniques to assess the quality of water, watersheds and uh, the supplies where people are taking water. And specifically, uh, one example, you check water supplies to see if fecal coliform bacteria are in the water. It is a marker, an indicator, that there might be human fecal contamination of the water, potentially human disease that would go with that, uh, cholera as an example, maybe something a little less dramatic like hepatitis. Uh, the problem you have in warm climates such as you find in Singapore uh, is that these bacteria can grow wild in the environment. It's warm, it's tropical. And so when you take a sample, you don't know if the concentration of bacteria you're seeing is a result of fecal contamination of the water supply or of wild bacteria. Janelle's work is looking at the DNA signatures of bacteria to try and find bacteria that have specific markers for having origin in the human gut. So that when you find these bacteria, you know whether or not you're seeing uh, actual contamination of the water supply and whether or not you need to take an action. There's a great deal of work related to water and urban design. I have a slide here from Professor James Westcote, uh, the Aga Khan Professor of Architecture here at MIT. And what, what Jim has illustrated here are a sequence of, of processes related to water in cities uh, that are the focus of urban design activities. For example, you can look at the interception of rainwater, uh, perhaps at a rooftop, perhaps with a green roof, uh, so that you can capture that water and put it to use instead of relying on water that's imported from your watershed. Uh, another aspect of this would be to look at stormwater management. When it rains heavily, lots of, you know, having a lot of paved surface means you get a lot of runoff, you get flooding. If you instead have bioswales that can trap water uh, and hold it to let it out gradually, you can avoid a lot of the problems that go with flooding uh, associated with stormwater and potential sewer overflows such as we have regularly here in Boston because we haven't got the, water, the uh, storm sewers and the sanitary sewers fully separated. You can look at urban design, you can look at how you integrate water into urban lifestyle and create a pleasant environment as well. You can look at wetland restoration so that you can manage the processes that go with wetlands. And you can also look at things like how you uh, respond to rising sea level. Some of you may have seen the article in the New York Times about two weeks ago describing how New York City is actively looking at what to do about potential high sea level events. When weather becomes more extreme, when the, the oceans rise a bit, you are much more likely to see flooding of coastal areas during storms. And so they're very concerned. They've got 200,000 people living with four feet of sea level. Um, here's another example. This is a project by uh, Professor Aaron Ben Joseph uh, in uh, uh, landscape architecture and planning. Uh, he has done this redesign in Japan. This is a typical storm runoff ditch on the left. You can see it's there to carry water away. It's sculpted deep so you can handle the surges you get in heavy rain. And what he's done is a redesign of this. It creates an open space. It's properly lit. It's usable by people uh, and which still fulfills its function of trapping stormwater. And so there are solutions of this type being developed uh, in the urban planning. Uh, this brings me to what's uh, my favorite subject in obsession, which is technology for water purification. Uh, I'll talk about a number of things here, but I won't go into tremendous depth because I know that you don't have all day to listen to me go on. Uh, I do want to start with a, a chart that tells you what it means to purify water. Uh, occasionally I'll talk to people and they say, well, what's the best way to purify water? And I say, well, what do you want to take out of it? And so really the first question when you talk about purifying water is what kind of purification you engaged in. Well, job number one is to get rid of things like bacteria and viruses because they make you sick, they kill you quickly, uh, and that's the most important thing. They're relatively large. This is a 
log scale of uh, approximate size of particles, you can see that bacteria are micrometer size, viruses are maybe tenth micrometer size. Both of those are relatively easy to kill using chlorination. It's inexpensive technology. We can do it very well. It's readily portable and readily adaptable. Uh, so it's unchallenging, in a sense, to do that. You have to do it, but we know how to do it very well. When you get to removing some of the more uh, insidious things that we can put into water supplies, man-made organic compounds, uh, you've probably heard about estrogens, you've heard about PCBs, these types of things, they're often smaller. And the technology required to get them out of water is correspondingly a little more advanced. Some of it can be removed with granular activated charcoal to absorb it. Some of it can be removed with certain types of membrane filtration at low pressure. But you're spending more money. You're putting a little more effort in to get rid of things like that. The hardest stuff to get out of water is dissolved salt. It's the smallest stuff. takes the most energy to remove it. And that's where the technology tends to become the most complex and the most expensive. And so sort of at the high end of things, if you like, the last thing you're going to do to improve, to expand your water supply is desalinate. You do everything else first. And I'll come back to that uh, at the end. Here's an example of a project related to water technology. Uh, my colleague Karen Gleason has been developing coatings to put on uh, membranes that will prevent biofouling. Specifically, these are zwitterionic coatings with positive and negative charges on the surface that inhibit the attachment of bacteria. And the bacteria can't attach, you can't build up the biofilm that gives rise to biofouling. On the right hand side of this chart are two samples of membrane. One is a commercial membrane, I believe it's a coke membrane, uh, and the other is the same membrane with a 20 nanometer coating on it. Just below that is the result of exposing these two membranes to a solution containing fluorescently labeled bacteria. And you can see that after about 30 minutes in contact with the bacteria, the uh, uncoated membrane fluoresces bright green. It's covered with bacteria. The coated membrane is doing very well. So this technology is being licensed, I, I believe, with all corporation. There's also technology relating to textured membranes, which inhibit attachment. And there's technology related to roll-to-roll -roll processing, so you can develop these membranes. We have activities in, in collaboration with the Mozdar Institute that are related to membrane distillation. Uh, and in this case, what we're doing is using hydrophobic membranes. They can't be wetted, but they're porous. So if you bring warm liquid up to the membrane, the liquid can't wet it, the vapor can go through the pores. And so you're able to bring warm water in contact with the membrane. It passes through a relatively low pressure to the vapor side where it can be condensed as pure water. And so this is being developed both from the standpoint of looking at thermally efficient cycles and from the standpoint of developing new membranes. There's a, a new class of technology that's uh, been developed here. It's called direct, directional solvent extraction. Uh, in this case, you have a solvent such as octanoic acid, which can absorb water, but which does not absorb salt. Uh, so you can put this solution and this, this uh, solvent in contact with saline water. You absorb the water from it. You take the wet solvent someplace else, warm it up. The water comes out of solution, and you've desalinated it. And so this is technology that's being embedded and commercialized here at MIT. This is technology, by the way, that will work with very high TDS water. I should say that the membrane distillation desalination also works with very high TDS water which means that both of those are technologies applicable to situations such as we encounter with hydraulic fracturing, where you're producing water which is extremely saline, much more so than seawater, and which poses great challenges for uh, purification and disposal. Another class of technology being developed here relates to humidification, dehumidification, uh, desalination. This is essentially an engineered version of the rain cycle. You spray warm saline water over a packing. Air flows through the packing. It's humidified. You carry the humid air to the other side, condense it, and capture the vapor. It's a simple idea. And it's also technically, uh, as far as the hardware goes, very simple hardware, which means that it's robust uh, to application in situations where you might not have engineers on site, uh, small villages, for example, uh, or situations where you may be dealing with uh, very messy environment, uh, a very, very messy water, again, such as hydraulic fracturing. The art of this kind of research is making the systems compact, making the systems energy efficient. Uh, the group working on this has produced about 10 patents and about 40 papers uh, dealing with that technology, and it's also being commercialized. 
Uh, on the uh, more distant horizon, we've got some work that's related to the use of graphene membranes for desalination. This is work by Jeff Grossman in Materials Science and Engineering. And in this case, they're looking at using uh, membranes made out of graphene, which is essentially a sheet, a single molecule thick, that has pores in it, uh, and which turns out to reject salt ions and admit uh, water. And they're achieving, uh, through molecular dynamics simulations, extremely good performance from these membranes. Uh, it will take some time for these.